It's hard to know where to begin a, a theological reflection on leadership, so Monty Python seemed to be as good a place as any to misquote the people's front of Judea, what has leadership ever done for us? In some ways, uh, it seems to me that the history and theology of Methodism in the British Isles, uh, the United States and worldwide, has to a certain extent been shaped by that question. Uh, but it's not new. The first book of Samuel outlines the arguments between Samuel, God, and the people regarding monarchy. 1 Samuel 8, but the, Lord, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, but we are determined to have a king over us so that we also may be like other nations and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. This echoes the call over recent decades within British Methodism for strong leadership, someone to fight our battles for us in the public sphere. If this is a question that's been troubling the people of God for three millennia, it's unlikely I'll provide much of an answer in 10 minutes. And how do we even begin to talk about leadership in an organization, a movement, a people defined as followers? Whatever the model of leadership offered in the form of early monarchy, there was no suggestion that this meant the kings were exempt from the call to follow. So first, I think what principles emerge um, from a reading of Scripture is that there is no exclusive class of leaders. Because alongside the Levitical tradition and a dynastic monarchy, there has been a constant prophetic voice calling power to account. In the ancient world, the challenge to the concept of being born to rule was pretty radical. But in that context, leaders were not afraid to say unpalatable things. In the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians, Galatians, the letters to the seven churches of Asia are prime examples of prophetic leadership. Second, and allied to the first, leadership is a calling, a vocation. Now that needs further unpacking. How do we define calling? How do we test it? Can it be thwarted? Does God only call people the church has deemed acceptable? Or is it that God really just prefers white, educated, straight men? <laughs> Leaders are not self-appointed. Paul insists that he is an apostle by divine calling, despite not being part of the original troop. Third, it seems that leadership is rarely singular. Moses and Aaron and Miriam, plus his call to delegate to others. The Council of Elders, the Apostles, the Council of Jerusalem, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, even models of episcopacy in the early church do not seem to be as monar monarchical as they eventually became. Leadership is frequently shared. We have put a lot of emphasis on Matthew 16, verse 18. I have called you Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. But it doesn't seem in the rest of the Gospels that Jesus ever appointed a single successor to lead the church. Fourthly, leaders hold a vision. And I quote from a Methodist report, leaders are called to hold, to hold before the church the nature of its calling and stimulate it to be faithful to it. All the New Testament epistles have this purpose, whatever the specific occasion of their being written, and thus are thus examples of leadership in action. Leaders help the local community to see itself in a wider church context. And it quotes many examples from Paul. But the question remains, who sets the vision that is held by leaders? And lastly, all leadership is service. The key text, of course, being the words of Jesus in Mark chapter 10, not to be served, but to serve. Most of these biblical principles have been outlined in Methodist, recent Methodist reports on leadership. 
And now I want to turn briefly to the development of the presidency in British Methodism as a case study in how these principles are being implemented. Since 1932, the Methodist Conference has elected an ordained president and a lay vice president each year. Increasingly, it has become a shared ministry. And this is reflected in the most recent induction service. The vice president and the president stand, as Bala will do in a few weeks' time, and this will be asked. The conference has elected you to the offices of president and vice president. In its sessions, you are to preside over its worship, its conferring, and its taking of decisions. You will be its representatives, embodying its authority and acting on its behalf. You are called to share with others in the oversight and leadership of the church. You are called to a ministry of visitation, to encourage the Methodist people in their calling and strengthen the bonds that connect them with each other. In all this, you are to exercise in collaboration the particular gifts God has given you as a presbyter and a lay person. And then they're asked, do you trust that God has called you into his service, has now called you to this ministry, and will give you the grace to undertake it? We are asked as British Methodists to speak of the presidency, which is now the current president and vice president, their immediate successors, and their predecessors, so six people in all. More importantly, where previously the vice president could only fulfill certain functions at the request of the president, now they both have the right to do so. There was a time, I am told, when the vice president only chaired the Methodist conference when the president needed to go to the loo. But the office of vice president remains an anomaly in the British church. At no other level in British Methodism is there a similar office, not at district or at circuit, or at local church level. Leadership in those places are, led, are by presbyters alone. That may, that, may, that may account for why the role of vice president is still not fully understood within as well as beyond British Methodism. This partnership of lay and ordained is often articulated as an ideal but not formula formalized in a particular role. I began to look at the current model of the presidency with a great deal of skepticism. I wasn't convinced that what we had worked. It was an invitation to work with the current vice president designate in his preparation for office that forced me to look at what we'd been saying, particularly over the last 20 years, and how it had developed. And I have to say my view altered. As I read to you, the president and vice president are called to visit widely and hear the stories in particular of different parts of the British and worldwide church. And that ties in to what we've been saying already. The downside about the annual cycle and the way that we do it means that once they've collected all of those stories, they rarely get an opportunity to share in any form of feedback. There was a time when, in fact, they had to remain silent at the presidency, at the, the conference after their year. So what would it mean to embody, at each level, the model of collaborative ministry to which we have been committed at the national level? It would challenge, it seems to me, the theology of ministry that we currently hold, particularly the notion that presbyters are public representative ministers of Christ and the church. Methodists, in common with all mainline churches, hold the notion that the office, in the office of presbyter, all ministry is focused and represented. Since Methodism holds also that there isn't an exclusive priesthood, different from the priesthood of all believers, in effect what we are saying is in particular ordination to the presbyterate makes of an individual the representative lay person. So where does that leave the lay person in the role of leadership? Whom do they represent if the presbyter is representing everybody? I find myself in a surprising place that I no longer think it is tenable to suggest that they only represent themselves, which is implied at least in our current understandings. 
even in the latest draft statement on ministry coming to the conference in a few weeks' time, the implication remains that lay ministry is time-limited, is focused on particular tasks, and is less representative than the ministry of the ordained. I think that creates a problem for us, and I do think that there is something to be said for, at every level of the church's government, having the model of lay and ordained together in leadership, district, circuit, and at um, local level. And I want to suggest further and finish by saying that a large part of the problem I think we have is that we are trying to fit the evolving theology of leadership based on diversity and equality into a deeply patriarchal and hierarchical framework. The crisis most churches are facing in terms of recruitment for full-time clergy may be the Spirit's way of telling us we've got it wrong. That we need to go back to the first principles and rediscover forms of leadership and ministry that are truly, according to another Methodist source, motivational, collegial, collaborative, and empowering. And with that, I will finish. Thank you.